Now we're going to have a look at a more complex nerve, which is going to be cranial nerve number seven, the facial nerve. The facial nerve does several things. First of all, it will provide skeletal motor to the muscles of facial expression. Also, to the posterior belly, the digastric, the stylohyoid, and stapedius muscles. In addition to that, remember that there are four cranial nerves that convey parasympathetic modalities. Well, cranial nerve 7 is one of these, and that means the facial nerve will actually also have autonomic fibers, so secretomotor fibers, to the lacrimal, submandibular, and sublingual glands. It also has some general sensory from the skin around the external ear, and importantly, it conveys special, uh, special sensory fibers for taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The process how it actually does that is quite interesting because the facial nerve has a little branch called the chorda tympani, which will hitch a ride on an existing branch of the trigeminal nerve called the lingual nerve. And by hitching a ride on this lingual nerve, the facial nerve is going to be able to add the special sensory taste fibers to the general sensory fibers from the trigeminal nerve. So let's continue by having a look at the course of the facial nerve, okay? So the facial nerve actually arises back here um, from a place or the junction between the pons and the medulla as two divisions, the motor root and the intermediate nerve called the nervous intermedius. Well, the larger motor root is the one that's gonna be interesting and important for all the muscles of facial expression and a couple of other muscles as well. Uh, the smaller nerve, the intermediate nerve, will carry taste, parasympathetic, and somatic sensory fibers. Uh, during its course, the facial nerve will actually traverse the posterior cranial fossa. It'll traverse the internal acoustic meatus, which you can see is ghosted here now. It'll traverse the facial canal, and then it'll exit underneath through a hole between the styloid process and the mastoid process, which quite intuitively is called the stylomastoid foramen. A couple more things that we can't really see here yet happen though after the facial nerve has traversed the internal acoustic meatus. That would actually be that it proceeds just a little bit anteriorly within the temporal bone and then it'll turn back posteriorly along the medial wall of the tympanic cavity. And then this sharp bend is called the geniculum of the facial nerve. Um, that's the site of the so-called geniculate ganglion, which is the sensory ganglion of the facial nerve. So within the facial canal, cranial nerve 7 gives rise to a nerve called the greater petrosal nerve, the nerve to the stapedius, and the chorda tympani. So then after running the longest intraosseous course of any of the cranial nerves, then it'll finally emerge from the stylomastoid foramen. We simplify it for gross anatomical terms though, I would say the facial nerve enters through the internal acoustic meatus, talking about what we're gonna be looking for in gross lab, and then it exits through the stylomastoid foramen where we can then see all these motor branches. And if we just focus on the motor branches of the facial nerve, there's a mnemonic, it's called 10 zebras bit my cheek. That stands for the different parts of the branches, a quite typical distribution pattern. There are temporal branches, zygomatic branches, buccal branches, marginal mandibular branches, and cervical branches. These are all the motor branches of the facial nerve to the muscles of facial expression. So let's have a look at this now in a little bit more detail on a illustration. So we can see how the facial nerve emerges here, emerges here uh, or at least the two divisions do from the pons and medulla, yeah, the motor root and the intermediate nerve. And then if we follow this over here, what is located here is the, the geniculum of the facial nerve with the geniculate ganglion. Coming off of here are a couple of important structures. The nerve that travels along here is going to be your greater petrosal nerve that is traveling towards the pterygopalatine ganglion traveling down here and then branching out as the parotid plexus of nerves. These are all the motor roots of the facial nerve for the motor innervation of the muscles of facial expression. And traveling down here is the chorda tympani. 
And you can actually see nicely how the quarter timping nerve, which is coming down along here, will join this branch, which is the one, two, third branch of the trigeminal nerve. So it joins V3, specifically actually, actually it joins the lingual nerve. And so now we are mixing these special sensory fibers that came from the genicular ganglion with the general sensory fibers coming from the trigeminal ganglion within the lingual nerve going all the way down here and bringing the special sensation to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. However, that's not all. In addition to that, we also have parasympathetic fibers. So the parasympathetic fibers are going to go A, via the greater petrosal nerve as presynaptic fibers to the pterygopaltine ganglion where synapse occurs, and then they will travel as postsynaptic fibers via a couple of reroutings and hitching rides on other nerves to the lacrimal gland to make tears. And in addition, we have the parasympathetic fibers that also travel with the quarter tympani. They join the lingual nerve from cranial nerve 5 as well. And these parasympathetic fibers will then synapse in the submandibular ganglion, where the postsynaptic secretor motor fibers go to the sublingual and submandibular glands. So you can see already that the facial nerve does a lot of very important things. In brief, parasympathetics to the pterygopaltine ganglion and submandibular ganglion, the motor fibers to all the muscles of facial expression, special sensory taste fibers to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and what is not indicated here, there's also a little bit of somatic or general sensory from the geniculate ganglion that supplies a small area of skin which is close to the external acoustic meatus, so close to the external ear opening. Here's another image that is quite useful in understanding the contributions of the facial nerve in terms of the autonomic fibers. So if we start over here, we have the greater petrosal nerve coming from the facial nerve, and then we see that it actually goes eventually through the pterygoid canal. It forms what is called the nerve of the pterygoid canal. Other people call it the vidian nerve. And the vidian nerve is formed by the merging of the greater petrosal nerve with the deep petrosal nerve. This deep petrosal nerve actually carries sympathetic fibers as we are in the head region. These are postsynaptic sympathetic fibers. So the fibers, the secretomotor parasympathetic fibers from the greater petrosal nerve travel to the pterygopaltine ganglion in this case. They are presynaptic. They synapse here and then the postsynaptic parasympathetic fibers will travel on adjacent branches all the way to the lacrimal gland or all the way inferiorly to pharyngeal branches and to the nasal cavity and the palate via the greater and lesser palatine nerves and to the nasal cavity via the sphenopalatine nerve. If we add a little bit more detail here, now we can see the internal carotid plexus and, well, actually the internal carotid per periarterial plexus, uh, which is traveling along the internal carotid artery. This is where the sympathetic fibers will hitch a ride as the deep petrosal nerve merge with the greater petrosal nerve, form the vidian nerve, and now we can actually follow the distribution of general sensory fibers. Of course, they do not synapse anywhere, they just travel. And the postsynaptic sympathetic fibers indicated in blue because we also need sympathetic fibers distributed to the periphery.